Well, when I, when I started out, obviously Ben and, and Carl Lewis were the, 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 the two most important people because what I quickly realized, you know, revisiting the race and the story and the context and, you know, the story from the Los Angeles Olympics in 1984 up to Seoul was that the key thing here is our, it was our rivalry. Um, and for me, the, some of the, the greatest sporting stories are about rivalries. And what was wonderful about this rivalry was just how different uh, Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson were. I asked Ben when I met him in Toronto whether he'd ever actually had a conversation with Carl Lewis, and he said, he said only once when he tried to drive a Porsche car that uh, Carl Lewis had been driving, and he tried to uh, have a go in the car after him, and he, he basically refused to give you the keys. <laughs> so there was this, only this one uh, conversation they'd ever had with each other, and they were complete opposites on the track. You know, Ben was very muscular. He was like a, a boxer. Carl Lewis was very graceful, uh, you know, taller, very elegant, um, so he was like a butterfly, you know, they were, they were just complete opposites and, and the, the more one was like the other, the more the other one went the other way. Um, and w what fascinated me was just, you know, Carl Lewis in 84 was unbeatable. Um, I describe him as a Michael Jackson of, of athletics. Um, he had that kind of aura about him. And Ben over the next few years really got into his, into his head and you could see in Seoul, um, Carl Lewis is obsessed with Ben Johnson. He keeps looking at him before the race, during the race, he drifts over towards him in his lane. So the, the rivalry really fascinated me. So Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson were obviously the key people I wanted to speak to, but when I set out, I had no idea if they would speak to me. Um, and as I read more about it, I realized that there were all these, this incredible cast of characters around them as well. I mean, Charlie Francis unfortunately died just before I um, started work on this. He'd written an, an amazing book called Speed Trap, which is extraordinary. And I spoke to a lot of people who knew him very well and really brought him back to life for me. Joe Douglas, who was uh, Carl Lewis's coach, a fascinating figure. I mean, he had a, a, a guru, uh, Sri Chinnoy, who might be well known yes. around here. Carl Lewis was very close to him. Um, and there were all kinds of strange people involved. There was a guy called Jack Scott, who seemed to be a good friend of Carl Lewis's, who ended up working with Ben just before Seoul. So there was all this intrigue. And then, most intriguingly, there was a guy called Andre Jackson who ended up in the, the doping control room with Ben in Seoul as Ben waited to give his, his urine sample, drank eight, eight cans of beer, Ben said, um, in trying to produce a urine sample. Uh, and many of those cans were handed to him apparently by this guy, Andre Jackson. And it turned out later that Andre Jackson was a, a good friend of Carl Lewis. So, um, you know, Ben remains convinced to this day that Andre Jackson spiked his drink in that room. We don't know whether that's true or not. Um, but there, there was all this intrigue around it and really fascinating characters. I think that it's, uh, I'm, I'm as interested in almost explaining the process. I look on it as a bit of a detective story. Um, and. You know, even now, if I was to rewrite the book now, there's new information come to light just in the last few weeks about what happened in Seoul in, in 1988. So new things emerge all the time. And, and there was, I, I did, it was a fear, a slight worry with this book that the, the story had been well covered, well documented. Um, there was a guy, Dan Gordon, making a film about it at the same time as well. But I was confident that there was still other stuff to, to find out. And, and that could have, you know, Ben mentions the, the shoe companies, there's the, the presence of Andre Jackson. You know, there's still a lot of mystery and a lot of intrigue about this. But I was also really interested to just revisit these athletes 25 years on, as it was at the time, to, to see, you know, what the legacy of the race was for Ben and for Carl Lewis. And, you know, when I, before I, wrote the proposal for the book, I, I was just looking around the internet for um, uh, bits of information about what Ben was up to today. And there were, there were various rumors about where he hung out in Toronto, mm. that he was coaching. And I, I was just fascinated to go, uh, for a lot of people, their, their last memory of Ben Johnson, probably him being smuggled out of Seoul after the, the 100 meters. He did come back a few years later, but you know, the, there was the race itself, and then a few days later, this, he was smuggled out of, uh, out of Seoul through the airport as if he was a murderer or something. And I think a lot of people saw that, and while they condemned the, the doping, they had some sympathy for somebody in that position. And so there was all this that I was interested in, and really in finding out what the effect of that race had been on, on these athletes and also on the other six athletes in the race.
I think with any book that I've written, I've started out without knowing whether the subject would, would even speak to me. Um, and, and that really, the first book I ever wrote was about somebody who disappeared, a cyclist who had vanished. And I was uh, very keen to write a biography of this cyclist, but it, it's, that, that seemed to be an insurmountable obstacle, the fact that he'd vanished. And it was a friend in the pub to me, uh, in the pub one night said, well, you just go in search of then. And the story then becomes the search for the, the subject rather than, um, you know, so, so the, the, that process of, of writing, of researching, of, of trying to discover things, it's very much, that is the book. But for the dirtiest race in mm. history, Carl Lewis didn't really speak to you, did he? Carl Lewis wouldn't speak to me. He, um, he demands a lot of money for interviews. Uh, so the, <laughs> the, uh, the film that was being made at the same time, they paid him, I believe, $30,000 for an interview and didn't really get an awful lot out of him. Um, Ben's a bit cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I did actually manage to ambush Carl Lewis. So I did, I did manage to get an interview with him. He was, one, one day in London, I was working in a library uh, and working on this book in a, in a library, and a friend of mine called me and said, did you not say you were writing a book about Carl Lewis at the moment? I said, I am. He said, he's, he's standing in front of me. Um, I'm in the Nike store on Oxford Circus. And I, I said, well, give me five minutes. I, I sprinted there, not quite at 10.7 pace, <laughs> uh, but I sprinted there as quickly as I could and managed to get into this closed event, flashing my press card. And there was a bunch of school children and a couple of reporters and there was Carl Lewis and uh, he spoke for a while and there were some other sports stars there but I managed to get Lewis uh, uh, on his own a bit later on while me and another journalist and managed to speak to him for 40 minutes without having to pay him which was nice and I'm Scottish so Did I don't like, to, don't like <laughs> don't to pay like money to pay. when I don't have to but um, so I, I got this encounter with him and, and really that's all I needed because it, it, you know it's as much about impressions I think and about yes. you know you, you, you can you can learn a lot about somebody from speaking from to others, the people around, yeah, around him as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, everybody who watched that race will remember uh, Ben. The, the whole bill, you know, the, the thing about 100 meters is writing a 300 page book about a, a race that lasts 9.79 seconds is, is on the one hand a challenge, but all the action really happens in the, in the build up uh, to the race. And, you know, I, I heard about what went on in the, on the warm-up track beforehand, the, the, the mind games that are going on between the athletes, and, in, and just before Seoul, you know, if you watch the, the footage, you can see Carl Lewis walking along the line, shaking everybody's hand. He, ca ca that in he your book catches as well. Ben eventually. Ben reluctantly shakes his hand, but Ben's last to settle in the box, which is, uh, I think, important psychologically to be the last one down. Um, and yeah, that look, that he was very low as well on the track, whereas Lewis was quite high. Um, and Ben, when, when that start, uh, you'd, been dis you'd had a false start already in the semi-final. You were given a false start, weren't you? I mean, again, I, I just reread the book on my way here to remind myself, but... I didn't false start, I was too fast for the gun. Uh, yeah, you were too fast for the gun, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, when you read it again, you realize... <laughs> In the in the in the quarterfinals, you were you were, you qualified as fastest loser. You, you were third in the in the quarterfinal because um, you eased up too soon, and and so you had to wait. I think you were 10.17, so you went through as fastest loser, and then in the semi-final, they they incorrectly called a false start. Um, they did it on on site rather than with the the technology that was available at the time. So. He was quite lucky to make the final in a way, um, but when the, the final got underway, you know, this, the, the second that it started, there was no doubt. I mean, Ben's start was, was extraordinary. Um, yeah, he, by 10 meters, he had a clear lead.